So as always, let's start with a few announcements. The schedule I mentioned last week has been updated. Uh, homework five uh, is due this Wednesday, 1014, and lab five will be due Friday. And then we will start lab six. So lab six and pre-lab six uh, start this week. And let's see, so I will update the schedule with the labs um, and the quizzes. So there will be no quiz due this week. I'll give you advanced notice on that. I think you have enough work this week to get the pre-lab done. But I will, advance, uh, I will announce assignments uh, well in advance. Uh, the schedule is current, the best that I know of it right now. And um, I will update it as assignments and kind of the pace of the class um, happens. So okay, we so aren't, my, sorry. Go ahead. So so that schedule isn't final. So we aren't stopping all assignments after homework six. <laughs> right, no, no. There will be more homework after homework six and more labs after lab six. So all right. um, and basically what I'm doing here is, um, you know, the, with going remote, uh, the class pace has changed a little bit with the change of the labs to the AD2 and uh, also with the AD2, I like to do the lab introduction. So I promise we'll get all the material in um, uh, and I will update that schedule as soon as I know what the uh, upcoming pace for the next few weeks is. So my office hours will be right after class. So come join me if you have any questions or you just want to listen to other people's questions. Also the TA's office hours are posted. You can join them on their respective Zoom links. Ask questions during class. Um, I like the participation, so definitely unmute uh, or chat and I will try to see your chat. Otherwise, please stay muted so we can keep the background noise low. So what I'd like to do is uh, start the, um, or resume, I should say, the diodes topic. So we talked about diodes last time. This was an introduction to diodes. Um, let me get my arrow here. So this is the schematic symbol for a diode. It has an anode, a cathode. This is how we define voltage and current for the diode. I gave an example of a resistor and I said, <clears throat> a diode is not like that. A diode is not linear. It actually acts like a one-way valve. And I drew the current versus voltage characteristic for the diode, which looks like this, right? So basically to summarize, when you apply zero voltage across a diode, you get zero current. As you start applying positive voltage, you get very little current until you hit the forward voltage uh, of the diode, which is about 0.7 volts for silicon. That defines where this knee in the curve happens. And uh, current can keep increasing as you increase voltage just a little bit until uh, you reach the maximum current, at which point the, the diode uh, uh, gets damaged. <clears throat> okay, then I mentioned this diode approximation at the bottom. This is a good approximation for design and analysis to get you really close to a final design or an answer. The The curve here, it, it is horizontal right along zero, uh, so zero current until the voltage V sub F, the forward voltage is reached, and then that's when current can flow. Right, so current can flow. So you might say, well, what restricts the current if this line is straight up and down? <clears throat> if it's not voltage, what restricts the current? The, the truth is it's gonna be a, an external resistor that uh, restricts the current. I'll show you that. But, but I wanna point this out. We're going to use this in an example now where we either assume the diode is not conducting and work the problem or the diode is conducting and work the problem. And I'll show you how to tell if your assumption was right or wrong. And that will help us finish the problem. So what I'm going to do now is switch over to uh, working a diode circuit. So here we have a diode circuit. Well, let me first mention that we're going to apply to the circuit this approximation that I just talked about. 
and use the standard definition of voltage uh, and current for a diode. And so I put this up here for reference so I can point to it as we work this problem. Here's the example. Let's suppose that you have a voltage source. It's a DC source, V sub S, and it's connected to a resistor in series with a diode. So the resistor has a value. It's 1,000 ohms, 1K ohm. The diode is a silicon diode. So a silicon diode has typically a forward voltage of 0.7 volts. And that's really all you need to know about the diode to work this problem. So our task for this problem is to find I1. So I1 is the current going through this diode. Um, and also just for convenience, I'll, I will define V sub D across that diode, the diode voltage. Okay. So <clears throat> when you have a circuit with a diode, one or more diodes, you're going to make an assumption about the diode. This is one way to solve a diode. It's a simple way to solve a diode circuit. You're going to make an assumption about the diode. You're going to assume that the diode either is conducting or is not conducting. So let me write those assumptions down. You're going to assume the diode uh, is conducting. Okay, and, and so what, what does that mean? That means that the diode voltage equals the forward voltage of, this, of the diode, right? So we're going to assume that VD equals VF, 0.7 volts, for a silicon diode. And then we're going to check if that assumption was right. And how do we know the assumption is right? We're going to check if ID is greater than zero. In other words, if, if VD equals VF, then I'm on the vertical part of this curve, straight line. And that means the diode is conducting. And ID must be positive. It cannot go negative. You can't have current flowing backwards or in the negative direction through a diode if VD is 0.7 volts or VF. OK, so we're going to check if ID is greater than 0. So I'll put kind of like a, a cloud around this. This is one of the assumptions that we might make. OK. Uh, another assumption, if it, if you say, well, I don't think there's something about the circuit that makes you think that the diode is not conducting. You could assume the diode is not conducting. OK, so what's that mean? If the diode is not conducting, you're on the horizontal line on this curve, and that means ID equals zero. Okay, so that's that's these that's what it means to not conduct. ID is zero, the current is zero. And then we're going to check our assumption uh, to see if, well, if the diode is not conducting, that means VF, uh, which is here, that means VD is less than VF. OK, so if if VD equals VF, uh, then the diode must be conducting. So if the diode is not conducting, VD has to be less than VF. VD can never be greater than VF. If you try to do that, you're going to cause a lot of current to flow and the diode's going to break. It just can't operate there. OK, so. So there's my other cloud assumption here. We're going to assume one of those, one of those two cases. I'll put a big, I'll put an or up here. So there's one of those or the other that, that we're going to assume. Okay. So we want to find I1 for different voltages, different values of VF, of V, I'm sorry, VS, the source voltage. So let's start with uh, VS equals five volts. Let's start with that case. OK, now, when I look at this circuit, 
I say, well, if Vs is equal to five volts, there's a really good chance that I'm going to be able to get 0.7 volts across that diode. I have a five volt source. I know there's gonna be five volts between the upper left node and this bottom node. I think, I think this diode is going to be conducting. But what I'm going to do just to show you uh, is, is assume the opposite. I'm going to assume that the diode is not conducting. Okay, so, th so that's my assumption. And, and so what does that mean? That means that, that I1 equals zero, right? I, I uh, not conducting, the diode current is zero. And then I'm gonna ask myself, is VD less than VF? And, and if it is, then, then I'm good, the diode is not conducting. So here's what I'm going to do to check that. I'm going to write an equation that lets me calculate uh, VD, uh, knowing the other values in the circuit and assuming that I1 equals zero. Okay, because that's what I assumed. Okay, let's write a let's write a KVL equation to do that. So my KVL equation. Uh, let's let's start at the lower left and go around in the clockwise direction. Let's see, I would say minus Vs, so hit the negative sign first. The voltage across the resistor is uh, I1, R1, right, with that polarity given the reference direction for that current. Okay, let's see, plus Vd equals zero. All right, well, let's solve for VD because I want to check if VD is less than VF. VD equals, uh, let's see, let me rearrange this, VS minus I1 R1. Okay, that's going to be, right, VS is five. This is the case where VS is five. And I'm assuming I1 is zero, right? Assume I1 is zero. The, Diode is not conducting, so minus zero. So VD equals five volts. So if I assume the diode is not conducting, that means the diode voltage is five volts. That can't happen, right? It can't, the diode voltage cannot go above 0.7 volts without at least the diode starting to conduct. And in fact, if I apply five volts across a diode from a power supply, I'm going to break the diode. It's I'm gonna put too much current through it. It's going to um, burn up. Okay, so so this is this is a wrong assumption, right? You cannot have five volts across a diode and the diode not conduct. So this is wrong. Okay. Okay. So next, since we know this is the wrong assumption that the diode is not conducting, let's assume that the diode is conducting. Oh, lost my screen here. <clears throat> so if you assume the diode is conducting, that means VD equals VF. Okay, why is that? Because you're operating on the vertical part of this blue curve here. So VD equals VF. Uh, and, and then we're gonna check, is ID greater than zero? Because that would be a perfectly valid place to operate on this curve. Okay, I can use the same KVL equation, except I can solve for I1. So let me let me solve for I1 there. So I1 equals, oh, let's see. I1 equals Vs minus Vd over R1. Okay. So what's that? That's a 
five volt source minus the voltage across the diode, it's forward voltage over a thousand. And that means I1 equals positive 4.3 milliamps. All right, so it's okay, great. So I have a diode with 0.7 volts across it and 4.3 milliamps flowing through it, positive direction. So that is that is a good assumption. So assumption's okay. Okay. All right, so these were my two assumptions here. This one and this one. Any questions on that, how, how I did that? Um, for the VS minus VD. Yes. Yeah, that. that oh, how, how did I get that? Yeah. That's, that's from this KVL up here. If I move oh. VS to the right side, subtract VD, divide by R1. So this, okay. this is from the KVL. So if we had a question on, on the homework, would it just say, like, uh, uh, is the diode conducting or is it not? Or do we just have to explain why or? or? Oh, a uh, question here might be, what's, what is the voltage across the resistor R1, right? Or what is the current through the resistor? Or what's the power supplied by the source, right? So you can okay. ask all sorts of questions about this, yeah. But, but in either case, in any case, you'd still have to make this assumption about the diode and figure out is current flowing or is it not? Okay. Okay, let's work the next case. Vs equals 0.3 volts. So when I look at this circuit and I say that Vs equals 0.3 volts, I think there's no way I'm going to get 0.7 volts across that diode, it's forward voltage, in order for current to conduct, current to flow. So I think the assumption should be the diode is not conducting. But again, let me work the opposite. Let me assume, let me say I flipped the coin, I didn't have any insight into that, and I'm going to assume the diode is conducting. And then um, that means if the diode is conducting that VD equals VF because I'm on this vertical part of the curve. And I wanna check if, uh, let's see, so the diode is conducting, right? Diode, let me make sure I'm writing in the same terminology. Check if ID is greater than zero. That's a question mark, right? These are, we're, ans we're asking that question when we make that assumption. Okay, so let's use the same equation from the KVL we did before in order to solve for I1. That means I1 equals uh, Vs minus Vd over R1. So now it's 0 0.3 minus 0 0.7 over 1000. And that means I1 would equal uh, minus 0.4 milliamps. Right? So then you go over here to your plot of what a diode can actually do, current versus voltage, and you ask yourself, can I have a, uh, a voltage, right, VF, can I have a voltage VF and have current flowing in the negative direction? That would mean the point is below the horizontal axis here. You can't have that, that, that won't work. Current won't flow backwards through a diode when you have a positive 0.3 volts applied across it. That's what that curve says. Okay, so this is the, again, this is the wrong assumption. 
and kind of suspected that. Okay, so now let's assume uh, the diode is not conducting. Okay, so when the diode is not conducting, that means ID equals zero. And if ID equals zero, that means VD must be less than VF. Okay, so we go back to our KVL equation. This is an equation that serves us well. VD, we're checking VD, that value. VD equals VS minus I1 R1. And that equals, in this case, 0 0.3 minus right, I1 is 0. Equals 0 0.3 volts. That's a point. That's a 3. OK, and then you ask yourself, can you have no current flowing through the diode and 0 0.3 volts across the diode? The answer is yes. It, it's on that horizontal blue line. That's where that point falls. And OK, so here's the, this is the approximation. How about in reality? If you put 0.3 volts across a diode, will you have any current flowing? Remember, this curve is kind of rounded there. Yeah, you might have a little bit of current flowing, but not much. So that's why this, this approximation gets you really close for design and analysis purposes. And we're generally going to use this assumption for solving diode problems in this class. Okay, finally, let's work the source voltage is equal to negative five volts. So if the source voltage is negative five volts over here, I think there's no way that I'm going to get positive 0.7 volts across that diode. I think that diode is going to be reverse biased. In other words, it's going to be uh, you're going to have a negative voltage across that diode. So in this case, let me make what I think is the right assumption, and we'll check it. I'm going to assume with that diode negative biased, with negative 5 volts, that the diode is not conducting. Okay, so what's that mean? That means I1 equals ID equals I1 equals 0. And I'll call that ID. Um, and that uh, we're going to check uh, is, is VF or VD less than VF? Okay, question mark. Well, let's go back to that form of the um, KVL equation. VD equals VS minus I1 R1 which equals negative five, right? That's VS, VS, minus zero. I'm saying ID is zero, so I1 is zero. That's negative five volts. Okay, and then you ask yourself, can that possibly happen on this curve? And I say, yes, it can, because when the voltage is negative, negative five volts, uh, ID would be zero. You're on the horizontal part of this curve here. So the assumption is okay. Actually, I didn't write that up here. This assumption was okay. Okay. So the steps are, you have a circuit, you have a diode, you're going to make the assumption in that circuit whether or not the diode is conducting. And then you analyze the circuit to see if, well, one of these two conditions is true for the check. Uh, if you make the right assumption, great. You had good intuition or you got lucky. Either way is good. Uh, if you made the uh, bad choice, it doesn't matter. You just switch your assumption and do another check just to make sure that, uh, that your assumption is right. If you have two diodes in a circuit, uh, 
you might have to make, well, an assumption about each diode. Uh, and what, there are four possibilities. Both diodes can be conducting, both diodes can not be conducting, or you know, the opposite state for each diode. So you'd have four different choices there. But it would be the same process. Make the assumption, check the voltage and the current for each diode. And uh, once your assumption is OK, you have the right assumption. Well, once you check uh, VD less than VF for not conducting um, or ID greater than 0 for conducting, then your assumption's right. OK? Any questions about that? The second two, that um, the assumption is that it's not conducting. It seems like we get the value for VD to be equivalent to this VF, but I thought that we were trying to find that VD is less than VF. So I'm a little confused on how it's okay. For, th for this one right here? Yeah, for both the last, that one and- Oh, that. okay. Okay, well, VD, so VF is uh, 0.7 volts. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And one more question. Do uh, most diodes have pretty low VFs? Are they all around zero? They, they do. They're not exactly zero, but you, you have uh, silicon diodes are around 0.7. Um, there are germanium diodes that have a different value, and then there are diodes called shot key diodes that have really low uh, values, like 0 0.2, 0 0.3 volts. So depending upon the, the materials used to construct the diode, you have different um, different values. The voltage ever be greater than one? I don't know of any diode when you have a small amount of current whose, whose voltage is, is greater than one. Uh, when you when you get to some really high current diodes, right, and you look at I versus V, uh, you you might want to so this curve might flatten out a bit, right? And the curve doesn't go straight up and down. So some of these really high current diodes you might get up to you might get up to a volt. Um, you, there's actually in the data sheet for the diode, and you can see this for the diode that's in your kit the uh, current versus voltage is published. So you look at the, you look at the diode and if, if you don't break the diode at, uh, by going beyond some maximum current, you can check based on the I versus V curve that's actually published uh, what the voltage would be. But for silicon diode, 0.7 volts is a good rule of thumb. When we get to Zener diodes, we'll talk about voltage regulators. Uh, toward the toward the end of the class, uh, toward the end of the course, you'll see that there's a special diode that you do use in the reverse breakdown region. We're not going to talk about that now. I'll talk about it when we get to voltage regulators. And those voltages can be in the uh, negative several volts range, but that's a different mechanism. We'll talk about that then. Thanks. Okay. Good questions. All right, let's do something practical with a diode. And by practical, I mean something you probably actually have in your house right now and are using at some point. Um, let's talk about uh, rectifier circuits. Let me write that more clearly. <laughs> So rectifier circuits generally are described as converting uh, AC to DC. So what this lets you do is build a DC power supply that you can plug in your wall and power something. We're going to talk about two kinds of rectifiers, the half wave rectifier and the full wave rectifier. Let's start with the half wave rectifier. 
Okay, so the, the purpose of a rectifier is to convert AC to DC. So let's have a, an AC source as an input. So VS of T is, uh, I'm going to make a sine wave because it's easier to draw than a cosine sometimes. So there is my source. Let's suppose somewhere over here, I have a load and that load is just a resistor. Okay, R sub L. And I want, to, I want that load to have a DC voltage across it. The rectifier is what I put in between here, that circuit, in order to convert AC to DC. Okay, so here's the rectifier circuit. Let's start out like this. Let's start out with just a diode. And so if you're drawing this yourself, skew the diode to the left a little bit because I'm going to add something in this area. But let's, let's start with, with just a diode to form the rectifier, see what it does. And let's assume that diode D1 is a silicon diode. And it has a forward voltage of 0 0.7 volts. Let's do this graphically. Let's, let's plot out what the voltage is uh, of the source and then the voltage of the load V sub L. And we'll use the, you know, what we just did in the last example to reason through this. So what I'll do is I'll attempt to draw a sine wave here. Something like that. So this is V sub L versus time, or v, this is actually, this will be V sub S, sorry. This will be V sub S versus time, the function of time. Okay, correspondingly, on an aligned axis, let's draw what the load voltage would be. Okay, and let's, let's put some values on this plot up at the top. The source voltage peaks out, right? Its peak voltage is 10 volts. And the minimum here, the trough here is minus 10 volts. Okay, let's start walking through this. At, at when Vs is equal to zero, right? This looks a lot like the circuit we just analyzed. When Vs is equal to zero, uh, there's no voltage anywhere across either element of the circuit. So Vl will equal zero. Um, as Vs starts to increase, right? Vs starts to increase, uh, what is going to happen is this. Let's suppose that it increases to 0.1 volts. As we saw in the last circuit, if you apply 0.1 volts across a diode and a resistor or something smaller than 0.7, no current will flow. All that current, let's say point, or all that voltage, 0.1 volts, will be across the diode, right? That's not enough to have current flow through the diode. So the resistor current is going to be zero. If the resistor current is zero, then that resistor voltage is zero. So you're not actually going to see any current flow, again, just like in the, the example that we did. Let me draw a dotted line down here. You're not going to see any current flow until the source reaches 0.7 volts. And at that point, you'll start to see current flow once the source voltage exceeds that value. And in fact, the current is going to flow through that diode until the source falls again down to 0.7 volts. So let me just draw kind of the top part of a sine wave here. That pulse of current causes a pulse of voltage. Okay, then the voltage of the source is either less than 0.7 volts or negative. And as we saw, when you have less than 0.7 volts across a diode or a negative voltage, 
no, no current flows through that diode. And so no current flows through that resistor. So I don't get another flow of current, another pulse of current until the voltage of the source exceeds 0.7 again. Right, so you can see you can see the pattern here. Okay, so that's with the circuit that I have drawn here. That's what happens. You get these pulses of current that cause pulses of voltage across the diode, Not across the resistor. Well, diode and resistor, but but the um, but the resistor voltage would look like this. That doesn't look very DC. Looks like an offset AC voltage. So what I'm going to do is add what we talked about during first order circuits, add a capacitor here, capacitor C. So that capacitor becomes part of the rectifier. And so what does that do? When when the voltage of the source exceeds 0.7 volts, you start getting a voltage across the resistor. That voltage, VL, is also across the capacitor. That means the capacitor charges. And if, if a capacitor has a voltage across it, that means there's charge stored. So the capacitor charges all the time this voltage is increasing. When the voltage peaks out at a value, right, right here, uh, by the way, that value is, if you did a KVL, 10 volts minus 0.7 volts, 9.3 volts. When the capacitor voltage and the resistor voltage reaches 9.3 volts, uh, that's as much charge as you're going to get in the capacitor because the voltage is going to start decreasing from the source. As that, let's suppose this capa uh, capacitor has a value with a resistor such that, right, tau equals RC, the time constant is, I don't know, bigger than one of these pulses. What that means is that this, uh, this voltage is going to fall from the source faster than the decay of the voltage stored, the charge stored in the capacitor. Okay, so what do I mean by that? The source voltage starts falling, the capacitor still has voltage across it, it wants its current to flow somewhere because it has a voltage higher than the source, current cannot flow backwards through the diode, so current from the capacitor flows through the resistor. Right? So now we essentially have, a, like in your homework problem, a capacitor connected to a resistor and the capacitor is discharging its energy into that resistor. You have a first order circuit, which means an exponential decay. So what you're going to see is an exponential decay like this. And then the voltage of the source exceeds that of the uh, capacitor voltage plus the diode board voltage. So you get another charging uh, cycle, charging pulse here, and then you get another exponential decay. So that continues like that. You, uh, that, that still does not look very DC, but I've got an example of a time constant that is maybe I don't know, maybe five time constants is like this. What if I take, what if I take the, the time constant and I make it really long? Instead of, I don't know, it's about four inches long on this whiteboard. What if I make it 400 feet long, right? I make it really long. Um, then what you can see is as you make the time constant longer, this exponential decay drags out, right? And eventually you can make the time constant so long that this, discharge is barely noticeable, this, this exponential discharge of the capacitor, and you only get a very small ripple. So you can make this ripple as small as you want based on the RC time constant. Just make the capacitor bigger for a given resistor uh, to get a bigger time constant, and, and then you could have a very small ripple voltage. So this voltage right here is, is the ripple voltage. Uh, it's the difference between the peak of the charging cycle and the, the minimum of the resistor voltage when it decays. Okay, so that's approximately DC. You get kind of like this DC value, oh, there's a ripple, 
And typical ripples you'll see are on the order of a few millivolts, maybe 10 millivolts, maybe 20 millivolts, but you can make a power supply now um, converting this voltage uh, to a DC voltage. And in this case, you took 10 volts and converted it to 9.3 volts. All right, questions on that? You said that the uh, ripple gets smaller as the time constant gets larger? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because a really, a really small time constant would discharge very fast. A small time constant would be, you know, just discharge, go down to zero. Bigger time constants stretch out that decay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, professor? Yes. So within the circuit, what actually is defined as the rectifier? Bet uh, between these two terminals, the diode and the capacitor, that is the rectifier. Okay, because without those two things, we would just have like a normal sine wave of voltage. Yeah, if you take the okay. diode, replace it with a short, and you remove the capacitor, the output would be equal to the input. It would oh. just be a sine wave. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, let me introduce you to the full wave rectifier. So let's do this. Let's have a, let me draw the rectifier first. It's easier to do that. So I have four diodes here. Draw that a little more symmetric. So that's the rectifier. Let me draw the source that's over here. And again, let's make that source VS of T uh, 10 sine omega T. I have to write it sideways to fit it here. It's 10 sine omega T. And then the load connected to the right side of these terminals is just the resistor, R sub L. And leave some space here, as you can tell, I might be adding a component, probably a capacitor. Okay, so the rectifier is here. All right, let's, let's do the same thing with uh, drawing the voltage across the source and the load. Move that over a little bit. Okay, so that source voltage, again, just looks like a sine wave. It peaks out at 10 volts. 
its minimum is minus 10 volts. And then let's plot the load voltage, VL, underneath here. Okay, let me do this by drawing the current flow on this circuit. Let's suppose that uh, Vs is some positive value. So it's part of the sine wave where we have some positive value. Let's draw where the current is trying to flow, right? So current is trying to flow with Vs as a positive value out of its positive terminal there into its negative terminal. Let's see how that can possibly happen given these diodes. Okay, so current will flow toward this junction here. Current cannot flow backwards through this diode. Right? The only way it can go is forward through this diode. <clears throat> right, so current cannot go backward through this diode. It can only flow forward, right? Positive current through a diode this way. I'll come down through the load. This way, it's connected there. All right. Go up here. This is, I've got this little hop over to indicate there's no connection there between those two wires. The current comes up this way. Um, so now current could, in theory, flow through either one of these diodes, but current is trying not to get to the higher potential, right? It's trying not, it's not trying to get to the the positive side, the higher potential, is trying to get to the lower potential, right? The negative side of Vs. So you get this. So the result is when Vs is positive, current is flowing down through the load resistor. Let's suppose now the voltage is negative, right? So I have a negative voltage, that means the current is trying to flow this way, the opposite direction. So let's follow the current. Current will go this way. Can't That current cannot flow backwards through this diode on the left. It can flow forward through this diode on the right. right? It's gonna go down through the load. And, you know, again, it could go, that current could go through either one of these diodes in theory, but it's trying to get to the, what is the positive terminal of Vs because Vs is a negative value. So current's going to flow this way. Okay. The point here is that current is flowing down through RL, uh, whether Vs is positive or negative. That's what this connection of diodes does for you. Um, let's draw that out on this plot. Let's see what's going to happen here. Now, for the positive half cycle of the source of its sinusoid, the current has to go through two diodes. That means there's going to be a 1.4 or 2 times 0.7. These are silicon diodes. Draw that a little better. 2 times 0.7. Um, voltage drop because you're going through two diodes with that current. That means you're going to get 10 minus 1.4, 8.6 volts peak of that pulse. When the, uh, and this is 1.4, when the negative half cycle happens, right, you get another, you can draw it like this, pulse of current, even for the negative half cycle, this didn't happen for the half wave rectifier. It only happens for the full wave rectifier. So you get these pulses of current, of current just like you got, I'm horrible at drawing this, just like you got with um, the half wave rectifier, but there's, their density is twice as much. You're getting you're, getting, you're taking advantage of the negative half cycle in addition to the positive half cycle. So that doesn't look very DC. So what you're going to do is 
add a capacitor. All right. You have the same effect of a discharging capacitor when the source voltage is low. Uh, the capacitor discharges into the load, so you get this exponential decay. Right. And if you make that time constant big enough, R times C, then you could get a very small ripple voltage occurring at the output of this rectifier. I have a okay. question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so what would be the advantage of using the full wave versus half wave? Yeah. OK, well, the advantage of using the full wave is this. You can use a smaller capacitor, right? Because you have um, clo more closely spaced pulses charging your capacitor. Your time constant can be smaller for the same ripple. So it lets you have a smaller capacitor. If size and cost are a concern, which they always are, it'd be better to use a full wave rectifier. Uh, but the full wave rectifier is a little, it's less efficient. You have 1.4 volts across two diodes that you have to overcome with your source. So if you have a very low voltage source and you're trying to convert that to DC, uh, you might want to use a half wave rectifier. You need a bigger capacitor to rectify, but you lose less voltage through the rectifier. So then for the most part, are diodes less, exp less expensive than uh, capacitors? Depends on the current rating of the diode and the size of the capacitor. But uh, they're, they're, all, they're all pretty cheap. Um, I would say if I, so there's a, um, uh, there's, let me, let me bring this to next time since we're going over a little bit or, or stick around for office hours. But I'll say this, that these full wave rectifiers are generally used to convert AC to DC for power, like when you're using wall power, commercial or uh, residential power. Um, the half wave rectifiers typically rectify smaller signals like modulated radio signals to try to get the DC or slowly varying component off of the envelope of the sine wave. Okay, so, but I'll bring that up more next time. Uh, for now, I'm a couple minutes over, so let me end it here. Don't forget the homework is due on Wednesday, and you'll start your uh, lab, your pre-labs due Thursday, your lab's going to start Friday. Of course, there's a lab due Friday also. Uh, check out the Slack workspace. There's a lot of chatter going on there. I'm happy to answer questions there. And if you would, post your questions on the respective channels so that I can reply to the whole group. Everybody can see my answers then. Okay, thanks for joining the class. I hope it's working out well. Let me know if it isn't. Um, and I'll start office hours in about a minute.